Hey guys, it's Will Kriske here from uh, Potato Strong. I just want to talk about the starch solution by John McDougall. You can see I got my starch drawer t-shirt here from his website. Um, this book has been amazing for me for a whole bunch of reasons I'll get into and I'll discuss a little bit about you know what's in the book but I highly recommend that you pick this up. One of the reasons is um, when I decided to try to start eating more vegetables and I made a, a batch of vegetables on the grill. I had a indoor grill machine and um, I ate this plate of asparagus and zucchini and that. And I was going from a vegetarian diet to, you know, to, uh, trying to go like vegan, I guess, plant-based. And I ate this big plate of vegetables and I was still hungry. And I went up and got some more and I, I was just hungry. I couldn't, I, I just didn't feel satisfied. And I thought, I just can't do this. You know, I was giving up the cheese and the oils and all that. And it was really discouraging. I, it's, it's really important to emphasize that, you know, the emotional aspects, just being hungry after eating. And I thought, this isn't going to work. And luckily, I, I, saw, I, I saw Dr. McDougall in, um, you know, Forks Over Knives and looked at his videos on YouTube and eventually picked up this book. And when I discovered that the potato was so filling, it was uh, it was incredible. Um, that was, you know, some people you might understand this is you're hungry all the time. You're kind of always thinking about food, and when you eat, you know, a short term later, you're you're hungry. Um, drinking maybe pop or diet pop to try to the carbonation, you know, to try to keep you full, or or tea or coffee or whatever. It, it, it's just a constant battle. Um, so. This was like an incredible revelation. Um, there's actually, I looked it up online, the potato has like the highest satiety index of all the foods based on people's reporting. And when, you know, when you eat potatoes, like when, if you ever notice like at Thanksgiving or Christmas, you eat mashed potatoes or something like that, and you eat a lot of other food, you don't really tie it at the time. I used to have the unbelievable full feeling almost painful, um, never really connected it to the potatoes at the time, but uh, now I have. Um, some of the, one of the key things is, is really to to be unabashed about the potato and starches and just being confident and explaining, um, Dr. McDougall explains in the book, the history of large populations eating starch-based diet, you know, gladiators and, and warriors and that going into uh, starch-based diets and grains and stuff like that. So just a real good explanation of the background so that you know you can have the confidence about eating starches there's just so much misinformation and fear about carbs these days that we really need this to be out there um, so I'm just gonna run through a little bit about the book um, he starts out he, he, he uh, references some of his previous mentors like Dr. Uh, or, uh, Walter Kempner with the rice diet and Nathan Pritikin who talked about high carbs. Um, just going to go through my notes here. Basically, Dr. McDougall worked in Hawaii on a plantation, and he saw some of the people on the island, the first generation people eating, you know, rice and vegetables and being healthy. But when the people came over, like, you know, Asia and some of the southern Asian countries, um, that they they started eating the second third generation of people started eating um, meat and dairy and processed foods and they started to get get fat and so he definitely saw the the difference so he's looking he looked up a lot of the you know the, the research and started to discover the benefits some of the doctors were talking about with regard to starch now an interesting thing is starch you know has a has a maybe a negative feeling about you know using it to iron your clothes or something like that but and it's a technical you know it's a, it's a correct scientific term but it's basically chains of sugar um, molecules that plants use to store energy so they they store these starch molecules and 
And so when we eat them, we get that energy. And uh, so, you know, fruits are more simple sugars and, and they get digested quick, quicker, more quickly. Um, but the starches, because they're chained together, you know, you have to break down that, uh, those chains into um, those bonds into smaller sugars. So it gives you that energy over a longer period of time. But both are great. I don't want to be uh, bashing fruit. I think fruit and vegetables are great, but it's just a diff it just explains a little different. It's, it's a more complex carbohydrate. Um, and if you look at, you know, one of the things that he talks about quite a bit is looking at large populations of trim, healthy people in the world. Um, now, when he says large and uh, populations, he, that you know refers to. Um, Japan and China and, and most Asian countries, they eat a lot of rice and vegetables. And you've got Incas in South America and the Mayans and the Aztecs in Central America. There's there's differences in, you know, quinoa and, and uh, sweet potatoes and, and things like that. Um, so those those were, that was the center of, of their diets. So when you start realizing that, you you know, it gives you that confidence that, hey, you know, these these populations, yeah, like Asians are you know, slim, and they eat rice and vegetables mostly. And, um, you know, it, it just, it really struck hard like, to, to think about it, because in, in North America, you know, people are eating all sorts of stuff and saying, yeah, carbs make you fat. And um, it just, it doesn't really make sense when you think about it. Um, now, some of the, you know, the say in the Asian case, they have a little bit of meat and fish on top, but it's a temper, you know, it's, it's a small percentage. So, you know, there's people that are going to be 100% plant-based, no meat products whatsoever, no, no meat or dairy fish like that. But basically, um, you know, there's, there's people that are putting that small percentage as a condiment basically on their food. It's not, it's not like three times a day eating tons of meat as their main meal. That's the difference we're trying to get to. So if we want to be a little bit more inclusive, um, to people that still want to eat some meat, it's, you know, the, the point is that it's not the main centerpiece of the meal, which, like, which it is here. And of course, everyone tendly, tends to agree on the processed food, the junk foods and the, you know, the, the processed foods, the packaged foods that are out there, ice cream and chips and that type of thing. Um, you know, everybody tends to agree that those are, are not great to be eating. So there's, you know, this chapter goes into a lot of uh, the wealth. If you look at Egyptians and things like that, the kings and queens, and the, the, um, these are the ones, the, the ones that were mummified. You know, they were, they actually looked at some of their, uh, you know, examined their bodies and, and found a lot of uh, issues with heart disease and that. Um, and that's because there's, you know, with the wealth came some of the richer diets. And they talk, he talks a lot about these Roman gladiators and, and that when people would think, you know, they eat a lot of meat or protein, but when they analyze their bones, that the, these guys, a lot of them were essentially uh, vegan diets. If you look at the, you know, so, so some people will look at the past and say, you know, paleo, people, you know, we used to eat all this meat or run around eating, you know, killing stuff and eating meat all the time. And there's a lot of disagreement. Um, it's, it's showing quite a bit now that, you know, a lot of times that was a rare situation. You know, it expends a lot of energy. And uh, it's a short-lived, short uh, you know, feast. And um, when we were in the around the equator eating fruit, and then as you go north, being able to eat starchy vegetables allowed us to, to, to move away uh, from those areas. And um, if you look... So, so people will argue a lot about, you know, what do we eat in the past? And that's, that's a part of it, part of the picture, but it doesn't really, even if somebody ate something, you know, it doesn't mean that we should nef necessarily eat it. And there's also these small little tribes um, that people will talk about, like Eskimos or Maasai, eat, you know, who ate blood and raw meat and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, they, they actually didn't live very long and they were found to have a lot of heart disease as well. Um, when, when people analyze it. But the point is that these people are in isolated situations that you know, they had to do that. And, you know, we, we really don't have to do that anymore. And, um, so, you know, we also need to look at our bodies and see what we are, what, what uh, our body is made up of and what, 
you know, likely things we're supposed to be eating. Um, one of the things is the amylase, which is um, it's an enzyme that breaks up down starch, and we have more amylase than some of the uh, the primates. Um, so we have um, you know more amylase, so it shows that you know we can eat fruit and everything, and that's great. But we also have the ability to break down uh, starches as well. Let's see here. Just, just that the same concept about you know starch turns to sugar and sugar makes you fat just doesn't really make sense. Um, Dr. McDougall talked about going to different uh, countries and in Peru and and where they eat potatoes and at Mexico, like in the rural areas where they're eating corn beans and squash and stuff like that, and they're just not overweight. Um, it just you know it's just an ongoing myth. Um, and, and you know, like I talked about the satiety of um, of carbs, of starches, and I, you know, just try it for yourself. Eat some, you know, add a whole bunch of potatoes to a lunch or dinner, and uh, see for yourself. And don't, you know, don't add a lot of fat and butter and sour cream and stuff like that. But uh, one of the things um, that he talks about is carbs turning into fat. What that process is. There is a process, but it's not very common in, in humans. Um, pigs and cows have a better process of turning carbs into fat, and that makes them, you know, appealing for food sources, I guess. But we don't. Uh, there's a 30% loss in efficiency when you're converting that. And if you eat enough carbs over a long period of time, if you overeat, you know, from your daily requirements, and there's people that think that, you know, Jeff Novick and that that you will definitely gain gain weight over time. But but uh, I've seen a lot of diagrams about glucose and the pathway from that to fat is hardly any of it will, turns into triglycerides. Some fructose, there's a little more that could potentially go to the liver and be and produce triglycerides, but it's generally when it's in you know fruit and uh, in starch that's you know encapsulated with fiber and in, in whole foods really it's it's it's. Uh, it's, it's not that easy for that to happen. So the idea is that, um, you know, the fat that you're eating is easily stored as fat. There's only 3% loss to, con to to store it, whereas carbs, you know, there's a 30% loss if it even ha and it's not really likely to happen in general. Um, for a lot of the studies that showed that it's just highly unlikely. A lot of the carbs will get the glucose and that will get burned off as heat, stored in the muscles, and, and then eventually get burned off as heat. In the book, he challenges people um, who don't really want to go full full bore into this diet is just to 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 try, um, like I say, adding a bunch of potatoes to your diet um, every day. Just start smashing in some rice and corn and potatoes, and you'll generally be full and not eat as much um, of other things. Gonna move on. He talks about moderation, um, how it just doesn't work for most people. If you think about food as an addiction, like the taste of salt, sugar, and fat, most of us are kind of addicted to that. Um, if you compare that to smokers, you know, they don't really tell people to just have a couple of cigarettes a day to, you know, to manage your habit or alcoholic, just to have a drink a day, or it just doesn't work. And there are people that can add a little bit of nuts onto food or eat a little bit of oil or something like that, but most of us once we start adding some of that food, it just keeps increasing. So I'll give you one example. I bought these sun-dried tomatoes that were in oil. And I would sort of damp out the oil and put them on spaghetti and that. But I noticed that the taste of the, of the oil and the, pep and the uh, tomatoes were, was quite nice. So I started pouring some of the oil into the pasta. And it just, you know, it just got more and more. And you've got a bottle of oil probably in your house. so. You go through those on a regular basis and have to order more. So um, a lot of things just keep increasing. Uh, if you get chips or something, you get it. You, you know, you start thinking about getting more of them, and you just—they're in your house. If you have certain foods that are addictive, so 
one of the things that really struck me was the moderation idea that everyone says, well, it's okay to just have a little bit of this, but we really, it's most of us can't really function that way because, you know, we get addicted and we just keep adding more of, more of that food. Um, he talks about, um, there's different chapters here, and I'm not going to go through all of them in, high, in, in a lot of detail, but he talks about, um, so like I talked about the traditional diet, just explaining around the world how these large populations, just, you know, they're starch-based. They, they might eat a little bit of meat, but the majority of it's starch, rice, and vegetables. And these are healthy, long-living populations. So that's that's kind of what we should focus on as far as our our fear of carbs and, and stuff like that. Um, he talks about some of the issues with animal foods, like with the excess protein and uh, cholesterol and, and some of that. He also talks about the USDA and the, some of the the corporate lobbying and the influence that they have as far as what they recommend people eat. And it's a, it's a very, um, it's kind of a vague, um, you know, they're just kind of middle of the road and, and, and you know, they want you to still eat your, your milk and dairy. And, and there's a lot of influence there from, from the corporations. And, um, you know, it just kind of explains that where they're not necessarily out for your best interests and, and, uh, you know, there's the the food diagrams and the the the, uh, the plates and stuff like that. You know, eat less. They say we just don't really want to talk about eating less. We want you to be able to eat as much as you can of the lower calorie density foods and and not really try to cut calorie. You know, cut your portions and of this type of food. It's just people can't restrict themselves very long. He talks about some of the environmental impacts. Um, you know, if you're not even interested in, if you if you want to eat meat and you're not really, you know, the health issues aren't, you know, you don't agree with or they're they're uh, not a concern. There's the environmental impacts of animals. People don't realize uh, a lot of the clear cutting of uh, forestry, the water demands, the fact that we feed most of the grain, the soy, and the corn to animals instead of to people. So the efficiency of actually raising a pound of beef. There's the um, the methane gas. Um, just the damage that the, uh, not to mention the animals, the abuse, like because everybody wants to eat animals, um, they have to have factory farming. So everyone thinks, well, we can have small farms and, and grass fed beef or something like that. But there's just so much demand. We've got 7 billion people now and more and more are eating meat. So the demand is high. You need the efficiency of the uh, factory farms to produce enough volume for everybody. And that goes with fish as well. So basically, the um, you know the, that we, that ends up causing a lot of the abuse, and not to mention that the animals are killed at the end of the day, um, which most of us you know wouldn't want to really partake in that, that aspect of it. In part two, he talks about protein, and you know there's a lot of myths around protein. Um, there's a whole bunch of things I could get into, but basically, the you know, rural Asians and that they found they consume 40 to 60 grams of protein. So if you're looking at say 50 grams, that's about 200 calories, 10 percent, something like that protein. Um, that's really all you need for your basic body functions. And even if you're doing some like I'm doing muscle, uh, some some muscle, some weights, and you know I did a calculation where the amount of protein you need just to, to build a pound of muscle a month is, is minimal. It's like four grams a day, so it's not really an issue. And the other thing is like plant protein. They used to say you know they're not complete and they have to be mixed and matched in, in each meal, but now it just shows that the body stores all the amino acids and can make the uh, the proteins that it needs. So plants are fine, full. They got all the protein you you ever can eat. There's, there, he talks about fish, like I talked about meat. There's also issues with fish, you know, mercury and some of the fat, the uh, farming that's not that great either off the coast. One of the interesting chapters that I found was chapter 10 called The Fat Vegan. And one of the things, Dr. McDougall and some people, they don't really like the, the idea of, of vegan, the, the, the term, I guess. And a lot of people aren't necessarily that healthy as vegans. They eat um, a lot of fat through some of the 
soy products, um, fake cheeses and sausages. There was these ones we were buying before uh, Tofurky brand made these uh, German sausages and these um, sp Italian, spicy Italian. And they had so much fat in there when we look back at them. There's ice creams and all sorts of things. And, and you'll see a lot of uh, vegan pages on Facebook and that YouTube where there's like desserts and things like that. So everybody's really excited because they can make a, a vegan version of, you know, cakes and muffins and pies and everything. But that, you know, you don't want me doing that every day. And th these are typically things that you eat in addition to your meals. So they're just extra calories. I mean, every once in a while, you, you know, everybody wants to have a little treat. But if you get into a daily habit eating desserts and having snacks like that are, even if they're low fat, there's a lot of, a lot of the, uh, I make some of the recipes that don't really have much fat but they have sugar, they'll have maple syrup, they'll have brown sugar, agave or whatever. These are just lots and lots of extra calories. Um, so the, the idea is that, you know, just because you're vegan doesn't mean you're necessarily eating the healthiest way. Um, I'm just going to briefly go through a little bit more. He talks about supplements, salt and sugar. Like he's not really worried about salt and sugar that much because, you know, when people are gaining weight, they're going to say, well, it's the, sh it's the salt in the food or the sugar, all the sugar they put in these packaged products. And um, when, you, when you eat the whole foods, you know, the salt intake goes down dramatically. And you have to watch, like there's some salt in uh, cans of beans and, um, you know, tomatoes, spaghetti sauces and stuff like that, but you can, you don't really want to be adding salt in the cooking process, but you can add a little bit of taste on top if you want, but your, your, your body adjusts, your, ta your t taste buds change to uh, less salt, but it's not really the, you know, thing that people should be focusing on. And then, you know, the part three, a lot of it is practicing the starch solution and um, gets into all sorts of recipes. One of the things that um, that's really important is to be to make sure you're satiated. So, what I do basically in the ideal scenario is um, I focus on the calorie density of the food. So, lower calorie density foods. I don't count calories or anything like that, but it's like fruits and vegetables, and you, you get into this about up to the starch area, potatoes and things like that, and you're at a pretty good bean. Start to get a little bit higher in calorie density and then the ones that if you want more if you want a rapid weight loss or you know you get stuck you can sort of you know you might be a little bit sensitive you can watch some of the pastas and the refined flours so that would be like bread even even like whole grain bread and stuff like that it's been broken down into these flours so they're higher density calories it's not that it's bad or anything like that but they're just higher density calories so it's easier to overconsume and get above your daily, you know, requirements. So the the idea is basically, yeah, just eat lower calorie density and um, and you know make sure that you eat a lot of starch until you're satisfied. So if you reach a point where you're maybe a little bit plateauing for a period of time, this is going to take a while. You have to be patient. So don't expect you know miracles, but I've actually had quite a rapid drop in weight, and then as it settles down, you you know you you can sort of try to maybe add a little bit more vegetables and fruit. I mean, uh, a little more vegetables and and try to eat more salads and things like that, um, just to kind of reduce a little bit of the starch on your plate. But you still want it to be half or a, you know a third, and make sure that you're fu you're full. So do a lot of observation. Like if you if you find that you eat a meal and like an hour later you're, you're feeling hungry again, then you know you think about the meal you ate and say, well, I didn't really eat enough um, starch. That's what I usually find. So for breakfast, what I do is I eat a, a big bowl of cereal. I have uh, rolled oats. So I don't, I don't make oatmeal. I just use them cold in uh, banana milk. So I, I use enough that uh, with some shredded wheat and some fruit, veg strawberries and banana to make sure that, you know, in full, I usually eat I usually eat breakfast and lunch about three hours apart, so like say from 9 and then 12, I'll have lunch, and that's usually three hours or so. 
That usually means to me that I've done a good job as far as the starches. And then for lunches, I'll have a lot of like quartered potatoes, mashed potatoes, at least half a plate, and veggies like corn and broccoli and asparagus or whatever. Um, dinners, I, have, I try to have a big salad. And then, you know, I've got all my recipes on the website from shepherd's pie to uh, tacos and all that. You can check out potatostrong.com. But each, each meal, I want to make sure that I'm full, you know, I'm satiated for, for a good three hours. Um, sometimes, a lot of times in the evening, I, I'm not usually hungry, but it's, you just have a little bit of a, a desire for something, maybe a sweet. So I'll have uh, a fruit. So I'll usually eat an apple. I like the um, honey crisp or an orange or a grapefruit, something like that. Sometimes in the afternoon between lunch and, and dinner, if I didn't necessarily eat enough potatoes, uh, I might get a little bit hungry. What I try to do is eat some potatoes. So I have a bunch on hand, like quartered potatoes in the fridge. I find that works best for me, so I'll snack on a little bit of quarter potato. I might have some gravy in the fridge. I'll just eat it cold, um, just to just to tie me over. So I'm, I'm trying to avoid snacking on like uh, crackers and stuff like that. So we we don't have any of that stuff in the house. Um, for the past six months, I haven't been in a restaurant or fast food place. So there are some ways to deal with those, but I just. I've avoided them, and then in the house we have got rid of everything uh, that was um, any oils and um, you know the obviously the, the stuff that we were eating before cheeses and mayonnaise and all that stuff. But any kind of fattening foods, right now I want to I still want to get down to a lower fat level, so um, minimizing the nuts, um, like no snacking on those or anything, and then like avocado. I've had over the past six months of you know a few times we put some walnuts on uh, uh, some muffins. But lately, I'm getting I'm I'm a bit stricter, and also uh, like avocado, just until until I get down a little bit more, and then I'll see if I can add a little bit here and there and see how it goes. But that can be a slippery slope back up to uh, gaining weight again. So okay. Anyways, I wanted to just point out that I, I really can't emphasize um, how important this book is to me on a few levels. One is realizing how filling the potato is when you're when you go you know, fruit or vegetable based and you just, you're hungry, salads and that, you're just not, you're not satiated, you're hungry, you might give up and go back to a meat or vegetarian diet. Um, so discovering the potato filling was amazing. Discovering the history of all these large civilizations that ate starch based and making you realize, you know, that carbs are not really a, the problem. And there's people out there that talk about, it's just, you know, calories in and calories out and that's true. But I think that one thing they don't realize is that if you're eating more meat, dairy, and, and some of the processed foods, the density of the calories is so high that it's easy to over, to exceed your daily requirement. So I would rather eat a lot more food at a lower density, like potatoes and mashed potatoes and gravy and tacos and stuff like that. And even, you know, the, the food that we eat, um, it just allows me to eat more and be more satiated. If you decided you wanted to eat higher density foods, you just can't eat as much overall of the, of the food. So if you're going to eat three to five pounds of food a day, if you eat a higher density food, you know, you got to cut back on that weight quite a bit. So that's just, you know, there's different ways to do it. If you, if you're just purely basing it on calories in and out, um, there's different common, you know, percentages, but for me, this is working great because I can eat and be and be full. A lot of people are just trying to restrict their calories. It just doesn't seem to work. They try to eat smaller portions. They're always hungry, and then eventually they just go crazy. So, hope that helps. And uh, anyway, I love the book, and I hope you guys pick it up. And uh, I hope you guys do this and get you know get rid of all your meds and lose weight and feel really great. And uh, I'd love to hear from you, so if you have any comments, please post them on the, on the video. See you guys.